Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Adrian Pelkus. I am a serial inventor, entrepreneur, and I have run a product development business for 30 years plus, uh, developing products for folks like you, people that had an idea, had a marketing, marketable idea, didn't have the wherewithal to actually create the physical product itself. They've come to me, and I've helped develop, again, 300 projects, which uh, has led to over 14 issued patents. Uh, along the way, I've helped coach many and many of you. I, I've actually coached over 1,000 of you. How many of you have been in my office? This is a show of hands. Thank you. Thank you. It's three to four every week, uh, continuously for the last 10 years. So. My business is A-Squared Technologies, and I've created a consortium of uh, associates that we call California Product Developers. The presentation tonight is based on a process I call APE, to simplify it. Um, my dad was a master architect up in LA, and I got to watch him develop hospitals and, and, and campuses, universities, all sorts of things for a different, couple of different architectural firms. And what he shared with me early on was that every project was done exactly the same way. I do it today. APE, it's approach, plan, and execute. Lately, we've added another P in the middle. It's approach, plan, pitch, and execute. Uh, but the, the, the main thing is the first stage is approach. That is to figure out all the questions there are about your project. Learning enough to be a master of your domain is very, very important. So I'm using this format in this presentation tonight. We're going to start with what are the mistakes we can make when we're just even in the approach phase. Okay, just getting started. Numero uno. Ah, my screen isn't changing and this one is. Okay. The uh, not acting on the idea. How many of you have gone into a store and seen a product you thought of? Well, you're inventors, you've done it. It happens all the time. That's what happens when you procrastinate. Waiting won't make you rich. So the fact that you didn't do anything about it. Now, we have 70,000 ideas a day, 70,000. So it's, it's hard to realize which one's going to be a good idea that you should actually focus on and help develop. But when something does actually get your attention, the second biggest mistake is you didn't capture that idea. With so many ideas and with such a busy life, those ideas are going to be fleeting. If it reoccurs to you, it echoes, it, you, it, it makes your heart skip a beat once or twice, you go, wait a minute, that was a really cool idea. Capture it, write it down, send yourself a memo, send yourself a text, send yourself a <laughs> anything you can. The uh, whiteboards, there's sticky notes. My house, I have sticky notes and whiteboards in almost every room. It's a way to capture your ideas. Mistake number three is thinking it's a great idea and just moving forwards with that, thinking you know, it's all going to come together. Take a minute. Stop. Evaluate your idea. Be objective. This is something I have on my website under new ideas. It's a product evaluation matrix. It's free. And the idea is you go through this and you look at these questions and see is this really worth doing. If your score is at least a 50 or above, double it and you can think it's 100 or above. If your score is uh, a, a B or better, you could develop your idea. If it's not, think of some other ideas because it's really only the very top 1% that ever really get it to market. 1%, one out of 100 ideas ever really, really gets to market. So just don't dive into it. Figure out if it's worth diving into first. Here's a really quick way to take a, a, a shot at figuring that out. Profitability, think of these as um, your multiples. Can I sell it for five times what it costs? Four, three, two, or am I selling it for a little more than I make it for on the internet somehow and hoping quantity will make up? Is it complex? Uh, it's a low, lower score. If everything's available and simple, that's easier. You get the idea. The lowest hanging fruit is something that's going to be very profitable, very simple, huge industry, no competitors. Good luck there. But it happens. Uh, there's no patents, there's, uh, you are unique in your intellectual property. Hopefully there's very few or no regulatory agencies to be concerned with. Uh, your development costs are low and you can make a lot of money the first year. If all those things line up for you, and go to the next step. Next step is about you. Uh, we all have lives. Some of the most successful people I've known in this licensing business had other lives. They were attorneys, they were uh, different, 
many different specialties. So the question is, what do you really want to do with your idea? Building your own company takes time. It's 18 months usually before you're getting into get some first sales going. It takes the resources before 3D printing. Uh, an average project was around $150,000 to go from a sketch to here's something I sit in front of somebody. Now that we have 3D printing, that could cut down to like 10 to 15,000, but it does take resources. So the question is, how much time do you have available? How many resources do you have? Uh, do you really have people around you that can even help you get this ball started? That's a SWOT analysis you should really consider because the starting the business is plain Sisyphus in some cases. You're going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting for a while before you get some cash flow. Whereas the license, you rent the idea out and somebody else runs with it and you only have to walk out to your mailbox to get the check. Makes it a lot easier. Will it still take 18 months? No. Depends on the company that you're dealing with, but no, that's the whole idea is instead of building a whole infrastructure, a vertical, you're going to a company that's been there, done that, does it professionally, wants to supplement their product line, can in, implement it and get it to market faster than you could ever do that by starting, just starting. Okay, mistake number four. Pan laws did change a few years ago. Used to be that you could actually create, keep a notebook and have somebody witness your idea and that was the invention date. That it's not the way it works anymore. It's first to file, first inventor to go onto a computer and say, here's my idea and send in $65 owns that idea. Therefore, your days of just speaking freely about your idea to all your friends is really over. People are unscrupulous. I don't know how long you've owned them, but when money comes up, people change. And when they realize you've got the next great idea and that you didn't file it, you didn't protect it, you could be out. That's how the new patent laws work. We want to change that, but that's the way it stands right now. now there's a lot of ways to protect your idea. The non-disclosure agreements, most won't sign it. I will if it's specific to what your idea is called. If you use that approach, other people will often sign those NDAs. Don't hit them with that up front and first, is my suggestion. Get them a little more interested in the idea, and then they realize there's something secret here. Your secret sauce often isn't the product. It's what the business is going to be. So you can describe how the product, what it's going to do, not necessarily how it does it, but what it's going to do. And that's an open conversation you can have to sell that idea. Uh, but when it comes time to talk about what the business is going to be, then you can ask, well, this is why I'd like to have the NDA signed to move, talk further. Trade secrets like Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken, those recipes are secret. They're locked up in a, in a, in a way that's known secret. Provisional patents, that's where most people are going nowadays because it, is the abridged version of a patent. You can file your own. They're getting, the, the provisional patent is never reviewed. It's just stamped with a filing date and you can call your product patent penny for one year. That year goes by so fast. You can refile it if nothing happens. Uh, most people use this again to open the door to license agreements because the two things you need for a license agreement are do you own the idea and can it make money? You prove you own the idea because you filed for it, you got the receipt at least. So you can do license agreements without a patent, but at least a provisional patent filed. There are design patents, there's utility patents, plant, we're not discussing a whole world of patents tonight, but you should know about that. The trademarks, logos and emblems and the brand names, those can all be registered. Uh, and the copyright is under Born's agreement, anything that's written with a little C is automatically copyright, you should still file for it. But not protecting your idea is a great way to, to lose it, okay? Why do you patent things? Personal example number one. 1985, uh, I took over engineering for a company called AstroGuard because Daryl Issa had taken half the company, moved down the street, and decided to make car alarms because AstroGuard had gotten some car alarms. I didn't know about it, I didn't care. A gentleman from LA comes to me and says he installs car alarms in Jaguars and BMWs and Mercedes and can I design him a car alarm with a remote control that'll lock the door and flash the lights. Sound familiar? So I did. We built uh, 500 of these uh, in my garage. That's how I started A Squared actually, was this the first order. So we built 500 of the very first car alarm that would lock your door and flash your lights. I never patented it. The Viper makes 56 million a year now. Who owns Viper? Daryl Issa. That name's going to come back up soon. Daryl Issa. Daryl. That's, yeah. yeah, Direct Electronics is, anyway. Number two, 
this little gizmo, I made it so you could program it, it would run around, it would plug itself back in, had a vacuum underneath it. I called it the rug bug. A friend of mine went to Eureka and they laughed him out of the room. They said, who the heck do you think we are, the Jetsons? Robots, right, get out of here. Because that was 1986. Again, I didn't patent it. So, what's that called today? Roomba. Roomba. You got it. Anyway. So, moving on. But take that lesson to heart, please. It really is important. It's really hard now because you have to file even before you've vetted the idea in any way, shape, or form. And that's what's really wrong here and hurting a lot of inventors. But that is the way the system works at the moment. Okay. Next thing is... Uh, conveying the idea properly. Um, you can do any of these as long as you do them well. You can uh, use sketches, you can do PowerPoint, solid modeling, mock-ups, working models, user videos. Uh, if you see, that's kind of a progression because there's dollar signs. You could probably do this yourself. You could do that yourself. You probably, if you don't know CAD, need to hire somebody for a little bit, a six-pack or something to help you with the drawings. Mock-ups, now you're into the hundreds or low thousands. Working models is probably thousands. User video, that's two in itself just for the video, plus all the work it took to get you there. So you've got something to video. All right. <coughs> so plan your presentation because there are stages that you can raise money these are inflection points, uh, depending on the quality of any of those uh, methods that you have there. The better the quality, the higher the raise. Wrong people, wrong time. I have people that send me emails going, I have an idea, I need a million dollars, can you help me? <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, I had one of those this week, just flat out. Uh, no, that's not the right, hmm? I'm still waiting for you to call back. Yeah. Uh, I have not replied to that one yet, as a matter of fact, that's true. So look, this is the usual progression for uh, showing your things off. It goes, usually you're talking to your friends and family first. They might be some early investors. Uh, then from there, they're introducing you or somewhere in your circle, you're getting introduced to professionals that can be mentoring you. They'll help you build your team. I'll talk about some resources for that in a little bit. Um, once you've got your team together and you know what you're doing, a lot of people go to uh, the Kickstarter and the professional angel groups to vet their idea. It isn't until you've got some sales going or a super well done business plan that you even talk to banks. VCs are the venture capitalists or uh, vulture capitalists as some call them. They're very rarely investing in startups. They put their money into operations that are already going and they will have a known return on investment because the operations are already going. Money in will multiply the money out. Anyway, the Chances of going to a bank or a VC right off the bat is very, 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 very slim. Banks like Axion will help you because they will start at lower amounts and raise up. The last person you talk to are manufacturers and license uh, uh, agents. Um, Leslie, for example, out here is a brilliant licensing attorney and she is not the first person you talk to. She's not going to match make you. Uh, she's the person you would talk to after you have gone through all the process, have landed somebody who's interested, have got the memo of interest or understanding written that defines basically what you want to do. Then someone like Leslie will come in and help you because she has a two-page spreadsheet on all the things you have to think about to make sure you have a good license agreement. Manufacturers. A lot of you go, hey, I have this product. I need to find a manufacturer. No, you don't. No, you don't. Do you have sales yet? Why are you going to put money into manufacturing something if you don't have sales yet? I know plenty of people with big garages full of stuff they can't even sell at a swap meet because they got into it so much. Anyways, um, you won't find any manufacturer that will say no. I don't want to make your product. I mean, it's, it's rare unless it's out of their, their wheelhouse. But, uh, so finding a manufacturer is one of the simpler things you can do. They all want your job, they all want your business, but they're not necessarily going to be selling your product. That's a different type of connection and agreement. So the sequence and the order that you approach these businesses. And they don't invest in products. They don't, that's true. Very hardly ever, 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 rarely ever will invest in your product. That's absolutely right. They, you know, in this country we pride ourselves on capitalism, but we don't subsidize startups. Off the soapbox, Adrian. Okay, next step. We've talked about the approach, all the things that you might go sideways with. Now let's talk about in the planning stages, what is it that, 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 that can go wrong here. 
again, remember that every invention you have is a business opportunity. And the more you've vetted the idea and, and looked into it and researched it, the more valuable it actually becomes. So if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And you need a roadmap. And that roadmap is the business plan. Uh, that's the same. Memorize it, write it down, say it every day. <laughs> If you don't plan, you're not going to get anywhere. No goals, how are you going to end up where you want to go? Uh, the roadmap is some idea of how to get there. And a lot of times you'll take detours and you might even change your destination. But at least here's where you had your thoughts together on what you're going to try to accomplish, how you're going to do it, and what the basic plan was. Go for it. Get it started. So um, you're going to need that for your license agreements, just to know the business marketing side of it. For your business plans, you need the whole enchilada. If you've never done this before, there's a software company called Palo Alto Software and Burke with his business power tools that offer canned uh, boilerplate presentations. Uh, Palo Alto, they have 500 business plans already written, all the spreadsheets, all the numbers, A to Z from the introduction, all of it, and you can uh, build your, 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 your uh, business plans off of that. So. It's a good place at least to get started because then you'll get to know some of the things that you don't know yet and that, that, that opens new doors and that's how you get through it though. Uh, Is that free? No. That's $99 the last time I bought it about a year ago. Cheap. Burke's business tools are even less expensive. The uh, next problem is thinking you're going to do it all yourself. Yeah, uh, if you can't get along with anybody, <laughs> you might consider that. Um, the more people you have, the easier things go. Uh, you will find it's next to impossible to try to do it all yourself. Surround yourself with the best people you can in the areas that you need help in, and find the people that'll do what you don't like to do. If you don't like doing accounting, don't try to take it on. If you don't like doing the selling, that's not your specialty. Do what you do best, delegate the rest. We'll come back to that word. Connect um, helps you put your teams together. I'll explain more about that in a minute. Underestimating your time that it's going to take to get this all going is a huge mistake. Uh, if you think it's going to take two weeks, think it's going to take two months. I had, I had two projects in the last year that were supposed to be five weeks, and they took five months. Uh, I don't work with that engineer anymore, but the point is there are glitches, there are problems, there are issues. If it isn't personal, it's technical. So uh, just plan with a padded approach. Um, so startups, uh, the research, your funding. Now these numbers vary on the complexity of your project. The uh, patents, the work to get the patent even uh, filed and going, the R&D that it's going to take, the time to take to make the mock-ups, if you're going to need tooling for it, uh, how to get your marketing plans together. All these are stages in your business plan that uh, you have to consider. Are those and all in series, or can a lot of those go in parallel? It depends on how many people you have aboard. Because uh, if you're the technical guy, you're working on the research, probably working on the patents. The R&D is usually research. This is often business research. This is funding the patents, the, the technical R&D or design work, making the mock-ups. This and this are usually combined. That doesn't happen really until later, uh, but that could be 3D printing. Marketing, the planning approach for that. I'll tell you in a little bit about how we help you pull this together through a program in, at Connect called Springboard. And we have these panels that look at just your marketing plan, your financing plan, and, and, helps, and helps to get it all together. Uh, again, the product, uh, new product development plan I created is a spreadsheet that allows you to uh, synchronize all these things and, and to think them out and, and pull it all together so that when you've gone through these 42 steps, you have your working model, you have a presentation, you can do it in eight minutes, you know the business, and you can explain why yours is the greatest thing for it. Okay? Executing. Well, so many things can go sideways here. Let's just talk about a few. Uh, this is now when it really comes to bear that if you are and are not delegating, you may or may not ever see your goals. This, uh, I've boot, we've, bootstrapping is one thing where you're paying for things yourself, but doing everything yourself becomes just 
overwhelming. The further you go, the bigger it gets, the more things you have to deal with. Delegate, find people a little help. How are you gonna pay them? Give them some equity, work with friends. There's always a relation there. You can, you can turn into a, a negotiation and, and get help that you need along the way. So instead of stressing out about all the things that you're getting buried with, bring in some friends, sit down once in a while, have a beer, and it'll all work out a lot easier. Okay, I, this, is a, this isn't just a pet peeve, this was a disaster this year. We were working with a company, we had developed five products for them, they loved it. The sixth one, we started into it and they changed their specs. And when you've got a microcontroller based system and you change specs, you're changing the sensors, you're changing the wiring, you're changing the circuit boards, you're changing the software, you change, it's just back to square one. And they in fact did that to us. It just wiped us out. We ended up at the end canceling the project because it was just so blown out. They realized it. Call them Jello specs because Jello, you know, you throw it on a wall, it just slides down. We need something that sticks. We need a target that stays there. You can't nail Jello to a wall, so we don't want to see Jello specs. Okay. Uh, other reasons things change is you know you, you didn't have good marketing information. Uh, the uh, engineering might have had wrong part information. Uh, all of a sudden somebody comes back and says, well, we can get it made cheaper over here. And you start redesigning the thing to accomplish that. And it's like, you don't do that. Uh, unproven parts. Uh, my DARPA challenge car, we didn't get into the third uh, or the fourth, uh, fourth reign of it because we had a circuit board where we used some new chips and it was a race to get it all done. We got it all done, plugged it in, the chips didn't synchronize. They didn't run, they didn't work. Unproven part. <laughs> obsolete. Uh, you design your whole product around something that went obsolete three years ago but you found it on Craigslist and it worked. So no, make sure the parts you're buying are still available before you design your whole business model around it, okay? Number 12. Uh, Stopping, uh, sidetracking for a trade show. The project development process usually is within an estimated time period and you have to live with that. If it goes a little longer, you have to live with that. The problem is when uh, people come to me and say, Adrian, I just found out there's a trade show next week. Can I have it? And uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right. You, you, there'll be another trade show in a few more months. And if you just wait, you'll get a much better working sample. I have horror stories about this. This one fellow approached me, he wanted an alarm system built, had a PIR, remote controls, had the whole thing built, a very unique shape. Uh, we actually had it working on our bench when he came in and said just that. I got a trade show, I got to take it, and I got to show it off. We hadn't attached the charging circuit yet, which was nothing more than a plug, two wires, and that would have been it. We just, he was just so adamant, I need it right now. Okay, great, take it, come back tomorrow, We'll put in the charging plug and then you've got your model. He didn't come back the next day. He didn't come back a week later. He didn't come back a month later. About a month and a half or two months later, I got a letter from an attorney saying that the product I developed for him didn't work, that it, was, it, it torpedoed his business because it didn't work when he was demonstrating, da 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 da. He threw true state attorney generals after me for this project, lost both cases because he took it before it was ready. So, moral of the story, don't take something before it's ready. Uh, that's the saying. You can write that one down in your notebook right after the last saying I told you you should remember, okay? It just ain't right. You get one chance to make a first impression. Get it all done, get it all right, get it all tested, make sure it's there before you hand it off, okay? First impressions matter. There's another show coming soon. Leads to the next one. Uh, kid tested, mother approved. Uh, testing the product before you put it out there. Obviously, you're gonna have a lot of egg on your face if you go on television and you've got that two minutes to show this thing off and you know, they go, okay, uh, we think it's interesting. Now have the guys look at it and they look at it and thing doesn't do anything like you say it does. Well, there was that chance blown. Test it first. Uh, life test things. Please life test. That's the idea that your product will uh, uh, keep working for more than just a few days? I don't have to worry about that. Sure. 
Uh, next mistake, uh, not getting it out there. Uh, you went so far as to create it, you probably got the patent. So, so far you've got this patent on your wall and you got a little sample of it. But I got to tell you, I've seen 40% of you, that's as far as you take it. It's just a trophy. It was all an ego trip. You're not, a, you're not an inventor until you've made money off of your idea. If all you have is that patent and that one model, you're still an artist. You've created a nice piece of art, you got an award for it being unique, but you're not an inventor. An inventor is somebody who's made money off of their idea. And that's what you're striving to do, is be an inventor. As soon as you become an inventor though, you want to change the name to entrepreneur. It's a way you introduce yourself. Um, the funding uh, is again, uh, that kills most projects is lack of funding. Uh, you didn't estimate enough. Uh, things didn't go the way you want. Uh, so take your estimates and double them. Uh, no, no other way to explain that. There's different types of funding, as, as you're well aware. Uh, there's one called convertible notes where somebody lends you the money expecting the company will take off and they'll convert it to shares later once the company is profitable. Uh, what they have though is a hidden advantage that they can pull on you and say, actually I want my money now and you're not ready to pay it back and then they almost or can own your company, which in cases happens and that's the story behind debt trumps equity. Uh, money can be lent, uh, it can be advanced as far as royalties go. Uh, there's the groups in town now, they're doing the synthetic royalties where uh, uh, they'll advance you funding based on a percentage they'll know will come back to them as a royalty. A lot of ways. Wrong team. Just like a bad marriage. It's hell. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have fights, you're gonna knock heads, things get broken, including the company, your agreements, your future, your ideas. Find people you can really work with. Make sure you do have the same moral base, same ethics base. You, you, you can't imagine what happens when people that are dissimilar, they get together for a business purpose and then they find out that they have completely opposing views on many other things and, and that becomes a really grating issue. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of ways people may not fit your style, your chemistry. It is about the chemistry is what I'm talking about here. Okay. Premature investments. Again, useless patents. If there's no market for it, don't patent it, don't go down that route, don't spend the money. So many of you create that little trophy and then you find out it's not marketable. Whereas if you've done your homework right in the first place, you'd have saved all that money and all that time and you might have brought something to market that is a better idea. So really review your ideas before you spend the money on these patents. Uh, <clears throat> you no, no longer have to dive into the tooling we now have 3D printing and additive manufacturing methods for just about every type of thing you could do. Another mistake, people go, I gotta go to China, I gotta go to China, I'm gonna save a nickel. No, you're not. You're gonna have so many problems, it's gonna cost dimes, you're gonna have no return policy, you might find a company that says they'll make your thing, show you a sample that looks like what you want, and then not sell, not actually ship that product. The stories are almost endless and there are books written about it and there are calculators about uh, the cost of doing business offshore. The total cost of ownership takes for granted all the shipping costs, rejects, uh, in, uh, logistic problems, communications, the fact that you're helping them pollute the planet, kill kids, whatever you wanna add to that pile, building the military, whatever. Uh, do you really want your dollars to be going to China when we need your jobs, or we need jobs here in the US? Back off of that soapbox, excuse me. Going off show too early. At least develop the product here. A lot of the jobs I do at A squared are where we do that just that. We develop the product from non-release drawings, get all the bugs worked out, create the bill of materials, actually create the assembly instructions, then it goes to China. As long as you've got somebody who does the QA for you, you've got a good chance you're gonna get what you want. Um, no two wanna? Oh well, yeah, there's there's Makita Doris. Um, the dollar difference and the logistics difference is uh, why a lot of people went to China. Now they're coming back and reshoring here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of associations going on now in Taiwan. I've set up two Makita Doors before. Uh, I'm just of the, of the last ten years seeing my business being flat, and most companies like mine close, and nine thousand companies leave California. Don't really want to talk about taking work to Mexico. Period. Sorry, American flag here, thank you. 
uh, <laughs> you don't go and buy yourself a car when you just got your investment money as extravagant expenses. All right, last two. Giving up too soon. That's the old analogy of the miner, and he's only two feet away from the gold mine, but it's taken him three years to get there, and he gives up. If you still see signs or have ideas that haven't been tried, it might still behoove you to try those things. Only those that attempt the absurd achieve the impossible. Um, those obstacles, sometimes they look like mountains, but if you take the little smaller steps, you can still overcome them. It's a, it's a mindset to be persistent. It really is. It's very difficult, uh, but it's often quite worth it. You've heard many stories of people that after enough years and after enough rejections, it finally clicks. The movie Joy, for example, with her mom, wonderful example of that. So that's mistake number nine, giving up too soon. Uh, intelligence, intelligent persistence pays. But what's mistake 20? You gotta know when to throw in the towel. You gotta know, you gotta know when to call it when you've been brushing a dead horse too long, okay? You cannot find a business model that's gonna work. You cannot find an investor that thinks your idea is worth looking at. Uh, it might be that uh, I've had a case with this recently that we created a company structure and the whole business model wasn't acceptable. People want an entirely different structure and an entirely different business model. So there's times to realize it's time to cut bait. You were smart enough to do something this brilliant to begin with. You're going to be smart enough to do it again. Do it again. Okay? Don't hold yourself back. And that, folks, leads us up to what are the four most important things to succeed are the money, the management, the market, the motivation. You need all four of those things to keep going to get yourself and your product to market. Okay? I love this quote about Teddy, from Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you can read that. Uh, sort of to, the, to paraphrase, it's better to try dying than to, have, than to die and not have ever tried. Hmm. That's my paraphrase. Okay. So, America depends on your ideas. Uh, avoid some of these mistakes, costly mistakes and uh, you'll have a great chance of having a great life as a great American inventor. All right? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Adrian Pelicus, A-Square Technology.